Chapter 22, Organic and Biological Molecules. Our outline is organic chemistry, alkanes, nomenclature, boiling point solubility and density, alkenes and alkynes, nomenclature, boiling point and solubility, aromatics, alcohols, aldehydes and ketones, carboxylic acids and esters, for all of these different groups, we will talk about nomenclature, boiling point, and solubility. And then we have the amines, and we will see that they are weak bases. Organic chemistry is the chemistry of carbon. 95% of all organic molecules are composed of only carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. We can also have in organic molecules sulfur, phosphorus, halogens, a few other elements, but primarily they are composed of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. So we'll focus on those four elements. <clears throat> hydrogen being in row one wants to have access to two electrons. It has one electron on its own, it makes one bond to have its duet. Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, all the halogens, they want eight electrons, they want the octet. Carbon has four, so it makes four bonds in an effort to get its octet. It can have four single bonds, two single bonds, and a double bond, two double bonds, a triple bond and a single bond. Those are other those are four common ways that carbon gets its octet in organic molecules. Nitrogen has five electrons on its own. It wants three more so it makes three bonds. Commonly in these organic compounds we find nitrogen with three lone pairs. Of course it has a, I, I'm sorry three three single bonds around it, one lone pair, or a double bond, a single bond, and of course a lone pair, um, or it commonly exists with a triple bond, and of course a lone pair. Oxygen, it has six valence electrons, it wants two more, so it makes two bonds commonly in these organic molecules. It can have two single bonds, and of course two lone pairs, or a double bond and then two lone pairs. The halogens, like fluorine, they have seven valence electrons. They want one more, so they make one bond. <clears throat> we often symbolize halogens with X, so of course that covers fluorine, chlorine, etc. And they have three lone pairs. This can be called the honk principle, kind of like the honk of a bird, where Hydrogen makes one bond, oxygen two, nitrogen three, and carbon four. This applies in these organic molecules that are neutral. Alrighty, so given this information, draw the structures of CH4, C2H6, C3H8, and C4H10. We know that carbon, when it has four bonds around it, has the tetrahedral shape, so looking at molecular shapes. We have the bond angles of 109.5. Carbon is sp3 hybridized. So when we have CH4, we just have that molecule there. We could draw the Lewis structure with it looking like the angles are 90 degrees, but of course we, in reality, know they're 109.5 degrees. Taking away one of those hydrogens and replacing it with another carbon with its three hydrogens, we have the next molecule. Now we have C3H8, so that has three carbons that we would draw in a chain, and then we would attach hydrogens. To the end carbons, we can call them terminal carbons, we have three hydrogens for the octet rule, and then for the middle carbon, only two. 
Now, if we look at the, the shape, each carbon has about it a tetrahedral shape, we end up getting kind of a zigzag look about the carbon bond. And we can reflect that in a drawing of it where we use what's called line structure. That's what I'm showing right below the full Lewis structure of C3H8. Make, to make it simpler to draw, we leave off the C, and we know that there's a C at any beginning or ending point of our structure, and any time there's a bend or a change in bonding that implies a carbon. Line structure makes drawing of structures much quicker than drawing the full Lewis structure. <clears throat> C4H10, so that would have four carbons in it. We could have the, them in a line, so one C after the other. It turns out there's another possibility that we'll get to later. So again, with that zigzag line notation, we could draw it as I've done there. So molecular shapes, we talked about the tetrahedral shape. When we have a double bond in our molecule, then we... <clears throat> have the about that double bond we have trigonal planar um, in this molecule CH2 CH2 we don't have enough hydrogens to <clears throat> not have a double bond so we know that that one has a double bond and the angles involved are 120 degrees the carbons are sp2 hybridized <clears throat> Triple bonds are common in organic molecules, and we see that shown in this molecule HCCH. Given the lack of hydrogens, we have to have a triple bond. So about each of the atoms involved in the triple bond, we have linear structure. The carbon in our molecule there is sp hybridized. <clears throat> We can have, have oxygen in a molecule, for example, and about it we have the bent structure. It's very common when we draw organic molecules that we leave off lone pairs. We know that they are there, but we often leave them off. We have the molecule shown below here, where <clears throat> we're seeing the bent shape with sp3 hybridization. We're seeing the linear shape about those carbons involved in the triple bond. Each carbon is sp hybridized. And then in the C double bond OH portion, we have trigonal planar for the molecular shape, and we have the carbon being sp2 hybridized. Of all known chemicals, and there are millions and millions of known chemicals, 98% of them are organic chemicals. So there's a huge number of organic chemicals, over 50 million. So we have to have a way to organize them. We organize them into what are termed functional groups. The functional group is the group within a molecule that has certain physical and chemical properties. So here are some important functional groups. We have the alkanes. They contain only carbon and hydrogen and have only single bonds. We have the simple example, propane, CH3, CH2, CH3, or in line structure, we see what it looks like. And the simple example, so that is this, the notation used, CH3, CH2, CH3. That is <clears throat> what we can refer to as condensed structure. So it shows the structure. It shows it's a chain of carbons where the first one and the last one have three H's, the middle one two H's. So it completely describes the structure, and it does so in this notation that we could use a, a, a keyboard to come up with. We don't need a special drawing program. 
The next group is the alkenes. They are also containing only carbon and hydrogen. They are what are termed hydrocarbons. So when, I'm, when a compound only contains carbon and hydrogen, it's a hydrocarbon, but they have at least one CC double bond. So an example of that is H2C double bond H2, no, H2C double bond CH2, and the line structure would, would be just, we could draw just like an equal sign. We don't have to show the H's on it because in line structure we leave off carbons and H's usually. We can have a triple bond between carbons. If so, we have an alkene and <clears throat> ethylene or ethyne is an alkene. That's the smallest alkene. So HC triple bond CH. We have a category called the aromatics. So they contain benzene type rings. Benzene rings have the alternating single double bonds where we have six carbons involved in the ring or at least six atoms involved in the ring. In those we have resonance. Alkyl halides, those just have a halogen. Alcohols, they contain an OH group. We see ethyl alcohol, also called ethanol. CH3, CH2OH, that's the one in beer and wine and so on. The line structure for ethanol is shown there. <clears throat> so um, when you come back and look at your notes again, make sure that you could come up with these line structures given the, the name of the compound, which we will talk about as we go on with these notes, given the condensed structure. We will not talk about ethers. We will talk briefly about amines. They contain nitrogen, and that nitrogen has a lone pair on it, and that makes them the weak bases that we worked with so much as we talked about acids and bases. <clears throat> we will talk about aldehydes. They contain C double bond O, H, and ethanol, that is an aldehyde shown there with its full Lewis structure and shown it with its line structure. We will talk about ketones. Acetone is a ketone. <clears throat> so it has three carbons with C double bond O. So ketones contain C double bond O where that C double bonded C double bond O carbon is attached to two other carbons. So acetone, and we see its line structure. We will also talk about carboxylic acids. Acetic acid is a carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acids contain C double bond O, OH. And we see the line structure of acetic acid. Ah, yes, with line structure, when we have atoms other than carbon and hydrogen, we show them. So in our structure for acetic acid, we're seeing the O shown. Whenever we have hydrogens bonded to atoms other than carbon, we show them in line structure. We will not talk about anhydrides. We will talk about esters. Esters are similar to carboxylic acids, except instead of having OH, they have O and then carbons. An example of an ester is methyl acetate, and we see its line structure. That CH3 shown in the line structure, that could be shown just as a stick. We will not talk about amides or thiols or disulfides or sulfides. Okay, here's a problem for you to do. To which functional group do these belong? So come back and do that problem just by matching up with our functional group table and deciding what they're part of. R, R is a symbol for any organic group. It is not the part of the molecule that we are focused on. It's the rest of the molecule. So for example, if we use the symbolism ROH, we are referring to an alcohol, not a specific one but an alcohol in general.
Alrighty, so now we will talk about the different functional groups, starting with alkanes. Alkanes are carbon hydrogen compounds that are containing only single bonds. We call them saturated. They have as many hydrogens as they could because they have no multiple bonds. So they are hydrocarbons containing only carbon and hydrogen. They are saturated hydrocarbons. So here's a problem. Draw the structures of C4H10. So come back and do that later. It turns out there's two isomers where isomers <clears throat> have the same molecular formula but the atoms are connected in a different order. We can have a chain of carbon or we can have three carbons in a chain with a carbon coming off the middle carbon. And so be below the Lewis structures, I have shown the condensed structure. So when we have the chain, which is called a straight chain type molecule, we could write the condensed structure as CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3, or we can get even more condensed and write CH3, CH2, 2, CH3. We see the line structure shown. For the branched chain molecule, we could write the condensed structure as CH3, CH with CH3 in parentheses, referring to the fact that it's got that CH3 group bonded to the C of the CH, and then finally it ends CH3. We can get even more condensed by noticing that in the Lewis structure we see CH with three CH3s around it, so we could write CH3, three CH. And we see the line structure for that branched chain type molecule. Those are isomers of each other. We can classify a carbon within an alkane by the number of other carbons it's attached to. It's a primary carbon, which we indicate with that one degree notation, which just we say primary when we see that. It's a primary carbon if it's attached to one carbon. It's a secondary carbon if it's attached to two carbons. It's a tertiary carbon if it's attached to three carbons. It's a quaternary carbon if it's attached to four carbons. So we have the line structure for a molecule shown to the right. So find the quaternary carbon, the tertiary carbon, the secondary carbon, and there's many primary carbons. So come back and do that problem. Alkanes come from decomposing organic material. Basically, they come from natural gas. They come from, or they make up natural gas. They're the gas component associated with crude oil. So it is, the crude oil is separated into its different components, its different fractions, using uh, distillation. This is done at an oil refinery and that's how we get the different fractions. We get um, the very heaviest stuff, the biggest stuff, that would be lubricating oil, asphalt, to the lightest stuff, the gas. Gasoline, which we put in our, our car's engine, that's one of the fractions. So all that comes from crude oil. Nomenclature how we name these molecules. We use the, the rules given to us by the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, the IUPAC rules. And those are to name the alkane as with one word. That one word has a prefix, a parent, and a suffix. The prefix is substituents, that's any attached groups. The parent is the, the longest continuous chain. And the functional group, that is like, is it an alkane or an alkene or an alkyne? Because our, the suffix of the name indicates that. A compound name is 2-methylhexane, where it would all be squished together as one word. I separated it just trying to show the, the substituents are 2-methyl 
the parent part is hex and the suffix part is ain. So what we have that the suffix is ane if it's an alkane molecule. Mm -hmm. The parent part, that is that can be called the parent chain, the main chain, the backbone, perhaps there's other names as well. That's the longest continuous carbon chain. If our compound is one carbon long, the parent is meth or methane. Two carbons, eth, ethane. Three carbons, prop, propane. Four, but, butane. Now we start using the Greek alphabet. Five, pentane. Six, hex, hexane. Seven, hept, heptane. Eight, oct, octane. Nine, non, nonane. And ten, dec, decane. So we associate meth with one, eth with two, prop with three, bute with four, pent with five, hex with six, hept with seven, oct with eight, non with nine, and ten with decane. Here's some examples um, of full molecules that are just chains. They have no substituents. So we see CH4, methane, CH3, CH3, ethane, and propane and butane. We're just adding one more carbon. So the prefix part describes any substituents. A substituent is a group attached to the main chain. So in the picture there, I'm trying to show the main chain to be the, the horizontal line, and then the little lollipop looking part on it is a substituent that's attached to the main chain. <clears throat> Alrighty, so go to the molecule I've shown, that huge molecule. I'm using the zigzag notation to indicate all the different positions of carbons. And I'm showing groups attached to the main chain. And there's many because we have many to talk about. So if the substituent is what we term an alkyl group, that means an alkane that's got a hydrogen removed, where that hydrogen is removed is where that group is attached to the main chain. So alkyl groups. If the alkyl group is one carbon big, we have meth for the one carbon, and then YL indicating it's an alkyl group. So in our molecule there, one carbon attached, we see it would be called methyl. If it's two, a two carbon attachment, it's ethyl. If it's a three carbon attachment, it comes as two varieties, propyl, which is those attached three carbons are in a row, or if we take the last carbon off and put it on the middle one, we have isopropyl. If it's a four carbon attachment, if those four are in a chain, we have butyl. If it looks like the the iso one, isobutyl, that's what we have. If we have those four carbons in a chain, but the attachment is not at a terminal carbon, rather it's at the second carbon, we have what's called secbutyl, S-butyl. We can also have tert-butyl. So those are different alkyl groups. We're going to see later that we need to know the alphabetical listing, so it's usually the first letter of the substituent. So M for methyl, E for ethyl, P for propyl, I for isopropyl. And that pretty much applies except when it's secbutyl or tertbutyl, the alphabetical listing is B. We can also have halogens as substituents. If, fluor if we have fluorine on there, we call it fluoro. Cl, we call chloro, Br, bromo, I, iodo. The alphabetical listing would be the first letter, the F, the C, the B, the I. Okay, so now we put all this stuff together as one word. We have the prefix, any substituents first. Then we indicate how long the longest continuous chain is, the parent is in the middle, and then the suffix on the end. So step one, we name the, the main chain, the parent, by finding the longest continuous carbon chain. So looking at that molecule, 
which has six carbons in a chain and it has one carbon coming off. Our longest continuous chain is six, so we have hex. We have all just C single bonds, so we have hexane. So that takes care of the parent and the suffix. Now we number the carbon atoms in the main chain beginning at the end near the first substituent. So we start numbering one, two, three, and so forth starting from the right going left. We identify substituents and number each according to the point of attachment to the main chain. So our substituent there is just one carbon big, so it's methyl. Its attachment is at carbon of the main chain number two. So we have two methyl on there. Then we write it as a, a single word. We use dashes to separate numbers from letters and commas to separate numbers from numbers. If there are two or more different substituents, we cite them in alphabetical order. For example, chloro comes before methyl because C comes before M in the alphabet. If there are two or more identical substituents, we lump them all together using di if there's two of those, tri if there's three, tetra if there's four. Those di, tri, tetra, the, the, the first letter does not enter into the alphabetizing orders. If there are two or more substituents at equal distances from the ends, we give the substituent that comes first in the alphabet the lower number. Okay, so here's an example to practice this. Name these molecules where I have the names below. So we look for the longest chain and then we find any substituents, we think about all these rules, and we, we go for it. So come back and do that problem. Sometimes we have cyclic molecules, cycloalkanes. They contain C single, CC single bonds joined in a ring. So our smallest is the <clears throat> triangular one, that would be called propane. Um, <clears throat> the next smallest, <clears throat> a ring of four carbons, <clears throat> that's the angle for that and the angle of the triangle one are 90 degrees, 60 degrees. Those are not close to 109.5, so they're not stable. The first stable one I'm showing is a five carbon one. After that, they're, they're stable. Nomenclature of the cycloalkanes. We name by adding cyclo in front of the parent name. If there's only one substituent, we just name it. No number is needed. If there's more than one substituent, we cite them in alphabetical. We, we, we um, list them in alphabetical order and we use numbers. Like we have one substituent, a methyl group, that's simply methyl cyclohexane. Two substituents, that are both the same, we use that notation di, so we have dimethyl, we have to indicate where each one is, so 1,1 one, one dimethyl and then cyclohexane. And then we have that next molecule. Sometimes we have these cyclic groups as substituents, so they're attached to the main chain. As substituents, we drop the Y, we drop the A-N-E and make it Y-L, we, of course, have the cyclo in front, so we can have cyclopropyl, cyclobutyl, cyclopentyl, cyclohexyl, etc. So there we have a molecule which must have a main chain of 10 carbons. We have at carbon number 4 a cyclopentyl group, so we have 4 cyclopentyl decane. So that would be another one for you to come back to and make sure you could name later. Okay, physical properties. We'll talk about density, boiling point, and solubility in water. The density for alkanes is between usually 0 0.6 and 0 0.8 grams per ml. So less dense than water. Water has a density of about 1 gram per ml. So they would float on water. If you've ever had gasoline mixed with water, you know that it does not mix in with it. It floats on top of it. Okay, so intermolecular forces, IMF, so they, they enter into our discussion on boiling point and solubility. 
And we have in hydrocarbons just carbon and hydrogen. And when we have only carbon and hydrogen within a molecule, we have pretty much a nonpolar molecule. When we have other atoms in there, like oxygen or nitrogen or a halogen, then we end up with a polar molecule. Okay, so that we'll apply that as we go on with our discussion. A very quick reminder of the three IMFs. They are the dipole-dipole force, the hydrogen bond, and the London dispersion, LD force. Okay, the dipole-dipole force. For this type of IMF, the molecule must be polar and as such contains a permanent dipole where a dipole is a separation of charge. And the dipole-dipole force is the attraction between the negative end of one molecule and the positive end of another. So we see that shown with the molecule HCl. We also see that shown with the aldehyde below where the oxygen is more, its electronegativity is greater, so it has the partial negative portion uh, charge and the carbon the partial positive. And we see that the carbon end of one aldehyde is attracted to the oxygen end of another. The hydrogen bond is an attractive interaction between a lone electron pair on an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine atom and the partial positive charge on a hydrogen atom bonded to another O, N, or F. So we see that shown with the alcohol ROH. The O is much more electronegative than the H, so it has the partial minus charge, the H the partial positive. So we see that two alcohols would be attracted to one another with the hydrogen bond between the O and the H. We can have um, compounds mixing with water if everything allows for that. And um, here we have a small aldehyde in with water. So the O of the aldehyde is attracted to the H of the water molecule. And that would be a hydrogen bond because we have O on aldehyde making that hydrogen bond to H on a molecule where the H is bonded to O. The last IMF is the London dispersion force, the LD force. That's present in all molecules and it's the only one present in nonpolar molecules. It happens when the electrons move to one end of the molecule creating a temporary dipole and that then induces a dipole in neighboring molecules and then they are attracted by the opposite charges to one another with the LD force. A big thing about that one is, although the LD force in comparison is often termed weak, it increases with molar mass. So the bigger is the molecule, the more the London dispersion forces are, the greater they are. So as we talked about earlier, molecules made of only carbon and hydrogen, the, the hydrocarbons, are pretty much nonpolar because the electronegativity values of carbon and hydrogen are very similar. So we would say most hydrocarbons are nonpolar. They only participate in the LD forces, LD interactions. Most organic compounds composed of carbon and hydrogen with oxygen and nitrogen are, on the other hand, polar. So they would have either the dipole-dipole force or the hydrogen bonding, depending on the, the details of the molecules. Strengths of the IMFs in general, the LD the weakest, dipole-dipole in the middle, the hydrogen the strongest. So when, to make a compound boil, to go from the liquid state to the gas state, we have to overcome IMFs. So the greater <clears throat> the IMF, the, the higher the temperature we need to overcome them. And we can see that in this table here of hydrocarbons, of alkanes, going from little methane up to big heptane. So each time we go from methane to ethane to propane, etc., we're adding one more 
carbon, of course, with hydrogens. Notice the boiling points go up from negative 161 all the way to almost the boiling point of water, 98 degrees. So although we only have within these alkanes the LD force, IMF, we have definitely it increasing, getting sizable as the molecule gets big enough. Solubility, so if two liquids mix together, they are soluble. And just read over that information, but to sum it up, like dissolves like. Polar dissolves polar, nonpolar dissolves nonpolar. So if a molecule is polar enough, it will dissolve in polar water. If not, it won't. So with the alkanes, what we have is alkanes are compounds that have in general low boiling points, but their boiling points increase with molar mass, with size, and alkanes are insoluble in water, being nonpolar. Okay, our next group, the alkenes and the alkynes. So in alkenes, we have at least one CC double bond. In alkynes, we have at least one CC triple bond. Notice that when we have the triple bond, we can't draw the Lewis structure with the rickrack notation about that CC triple bond. Rather, we have to make it linear on both sides of the CC triple bond. Okay, nomenclature. We find the longest carbon chain containing the multiple bond. The ending is ENE -E for alkenes and YNE -E for alkynes. We number the carbon so that the multiple bond has the lowest numbers, and we indicate the number of the multiple bond by giving the number of the first multiple bonded carbon. We see the smallest alkene is ethene, so two carbons big. Its line structure would just be looking like a elongated equal sign. We add a carbon to that, we have propene. We haven't needed to use numbers until we get to four carbons big. For butene, we can have the double bond between carbons one and two. If so, we have one butene, or we can have the double bond between carbons two and three. If so, we have two butene. We can have substituents attached like we do with 3-methyl-1-butene. So looking next at the triple bond, the smallest al alkyne would be eth ethyne, and its, Lewis its uh, line structure would just be the, the triple bond. If we put a carbon on that, we have propyne. Notice the linear way it's drawn. In the Lewis structure. If we put one more carbon on, we can have one butyne, which I'm showing there, or we can have two butyne. So draw two butyne just for practice. Notice about the triple bond, we have the, the linear structure in the line structure. We can have cyclic alkenes, not cyclic alkynes, the bond angles just wouldn't work. Here we have a four, a six carbon one, so we have cyclohexene. No numbers needed. It's just simply taken to be between carbons one and two. And we have a cyclohexene with an attachment. Now we need a number for the attachment. One and two, those are the carbons with the double bond, and that puts the chlorine at carbon three. This por porcupine, 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 that is a bumper sticker I saw on somebody's car some years ago. I thought you might think it's cute. Structure of alkenes. So about a single bond, we can rotate. The, mole the atoms can rotate relative to each other. Because with a single bond, we have electrons between the nuclei. We have what we term the sigma bond. When we have a pi bond, and I've shown the picture of that over on the right, we have 
the p atomic orbitals having to be parallel to one another to make that pi bond. The electrons are above and below. So whenever we have a double bond or a triple bond for that matter, we've got the, the need to have parallel p atomic orbitals to make the bond. What that means is bonds do not rotate about a multiple bond. So about a double or triple bond, we don't have rotation in those carbon atoms. What that ends up with is two possible isomers when we have the CC single bond, a CC double bond. So let's look at isomers of C2H2Cl2. If we put both chlorines on the same carbon, well, we have 1,1-dichloroethene. If we put them on different carbons, we can have them both on the same side, up or down, like I've shown here with cis-1,2-dichloroethene, or we can have them one on top, one on the bottom, so on opposite sides. If so, we have trans-1,2-dichloroethene. And we can't rotate between those two. We have to break bonds to, to go between them. So we end up with isomers of one another. Here's a problem. Which molecules can exist as cis-trans isomers? So from those names, draw the Lewis structures for practice and see if you can come up with both cis and trans. In the alkynes, like 2-hexyne, we, we don't have two possibilities. That only arises in the alkenes, the cis and trans possibilities. Okay, physical properties. Alkenes and alkynes are nonpolar. They are hydrocarbons. They're nonpolar, so their IMF forces are only LDs. Boiling points are like with the alkanes, low, but increase with increasing molar mass. And like the alkanes, they are not water-soluble. Aromatic com compounds, they contain benzene-like rings. So benzene is that structure I've shown there, C6H6. So it's a cyclic compound with those alternating single double bonds. In reality, there's resonance, so it's a kind of a smearing around the whole ring structure of those pi electrons. And at each carbon, there can be one attachment. Usually it's hydrogen. Benzene and all compounds containing benzene-like rings are called aromatic, having nothing to do with their smell. Um, they can be aromatic and have a nitrogen or an oxygen in the ring. Nomenclature. If it has one substituent, we just name that substituent followed by benzene, so chlorobenzene, ethylbenzene. If we have two substituents, we use numbers <clears throat> or the ortho meta para notation. So if they're on adjacent carbons, we could use the numbers 1, 2, or ortho. And an example I'm giving of that is we have chlorines on adjacent carbons, so we could name it 1,2-dichlorobenzene, or they're ortho relative to each other, so we would drop the 1,2 and simply write O. So we'd say ortho-dichlorobenzene. If we have them separated by a carbon, we have the 1,3 or meta. So our example, ah, we don't have an example, okay. Um, so that would we would use numbers or the meta notation. We can have them opposite to each other. So we use numbers 1, 4, or para. So we have the example there where we have a bromo group, an ethyl group opposite to each other. We name bromo before ethyl comes first in the alphabet, so we also give it the smaller number, 1. So we have 1 bromo, 4 ethyl benzene, or we could simply say para bromoethylbenzene. When we have three or more substituents, then we use numbers, like in that example I've given there. Benzene can be a substituent if it's attached to a, a, a long parent. 
as a substituent, it's its name ends YL, kind of like the alkyl substituents, but it's called phenyl, not benzyl. It's called phenyl. So C6H5 as an attachment is phenyl. So we have the example of 2-phenyl octane, and we have that other example. So come back to those and make sure you could name them. So in benzene, we have resonance, and we have those two resonance structures. Physical properties, benzene is a hydrocarbon, so the IMFs are the London dispersion forces. Um, boiling point is similar to that of other C6, so six carbons, big hydrocarbons. And benzene is insoluble in water. Alcohols, ROH. Nomenclature, we find the longest chain that contains the carbon with the OH attached to it. The ending is OL. And actually, we name the alcohol by dropping the E of the alkane and replacing it with OL. Methanol, ethanol. So we keep that kind of like methan part. We keep the AN in there. Step two, number the carbons in the chain beginning with the end closer to the carbon containing the OH group. In a cyclic alcohol, COH is C1, and we continue in the direction that gives the, any substituents the lowest possible numbers. Step three, put the number of the COH immediately before the parent name. In a cyclic alcohol, a 1 is not needed to locate the OH group. Okay, so we have a molecule there that's an alcohol because it has an OH group. It's six carbons long. We start numbering at the right side because that has us give the lowest possible number to the carbon containing the OH group. And then we just name the other substituents. So we have 4, 5, dimethyl, 3, hexanol. So practice doing those two molecules I show here. Alcohols are classified as primary, secondary, or tertiary. In a primary alcohol, the OH is bonded to a carbon that's bonded to one other carbon. In a secondary alcohol, the OH is bonded to a carbon that's bonded to two other alcohols. And in a tertiary alcohol, OH is bonded to a carbon that's bonded to three other carbons. Okay, physical properties. Alcohols have an R group. Alcohols have an OH group. The OH group can hydrogen bond to other OH groups. The R group can do a London dispersion kind of interaction to other nonpolar groups, other R groups. Okay, so that affects the boiling point. That makes the ability of alcohols to hydrogen bond between the OH groups makes them have boiling points higher than those of similar sized hydrocarbons. And then as the R groups get longer, the boiling points go up because of more LD interactions. So in our table, let's compare CH3 and its boiling point of 65 degrees to CH3, CH2, OH with its boiling point of 79 degrees. So they both have boiling points much higher than the corresponding alkane shown above them in our table. And the longer alcohol, ethanol, has the higher boiling point because of the interactions of the R groups with other alcohol molecules. So as the size of the alcohol increases, the um, R group interaction increases, boiling points go up. Water solubility, well, the OH part of the alcohol likes water, well, water likes it, provided the R group is not very big, then the molecule, the alcohol, can be water-soluble. Methanol 
one carbon big, ethanol two carbons, propanol three carbons big. Those are all completely water soluble. We could call them miscible. And that's because the R group is small enough that the OH portion of it works with water. But in butanol, so four carbons big, it, it's soluble in only small proportions because the R group does not like the, the water. And as we go to bigger alcohols, the water solubility decreases. But in general, alcohols have higher water solubilities than those of comparable hydrocarbons. Okay, so here's a problem to do. Um, rank these compounds that I give you here in order of increasing boiling point. So come back later and do that problem. And here's a problem. Rank in order of increasing water solubility. So those molecules there. So come back and do that problem. Now we will talk about aldehydes and ketones. They both contain the C double bond O group, which is called the carbonyl group. In aldehydes, the C, the carbonyl C, has an H bonded to it. In alkenes, the carbonyl C has no H bonded to it. It has only R groups bonded to it. Um, an abbreviation for the Alkyl, the aldehyde group is CHO, so C, and then the H bonded to it, and then that O of the double bond, CHO. So nomenclature. Aldehydes, we have a few that have common names, which I gave to you. The IUPAC naming system is what, what we follow. And um, the smallest aldehyde is methanal, so the ending is AL. No number is needed for the, the carbonyl group. It's always C1, given the octet rule. So the smallest is methanal. Next, I'm showing a three-carbon aldehyde, a three-carbon in the chain aldehyde with one substituent. So that would be propanal, and then at carbon number two, because carbon number one is the carbonyl carbon, at carbon number two we have the methyl group, so we have two methyl propanal. That next one I don't expect you to be able to name because it has more than 10 carbons in its main chain, but it is a main component in the scent of Chanel number no. five perfume, and I thought you might enjoy seeing that. It's an aldehyde. Ketones. Well, the one with the common name that you probably have heard is acetone, so that's a three-carbon compound. In the IU, IUPAC naming, the compound would be called propanone. The ending is O-N-E for ketone, and um, we number the carbonyl group usually, but it depends on how big the compound is. In propanone, it can only be at that one position, so we don't need a number, so it's simply propanone or acetone. When we have a six carbon one, well, we do need to number where that carbonyl group is. If it's at carbon number two, we have two hexanone. We can have cyclic ketones like cyclopentanone, so a five carbon ring with a ketone group. So come back and name the, the next one, the 3 phenyl butanone on your own. Physical properties, well, we have a polar molecule. We don't have H bonded to the O, so we have the simply the dipole-dipole force. And the boiling points are higher in aldehydes and ketones than in comparable hydrocarbons, but lower than in comparable alcohols. So remember that hydro the hydrocarbons only have LD, so that makes it lower than dipole-dipole of the aldehydes and ketones. Alcohols have hydrogen bonding, which makes them higher than the dipole-dipole of the aldehydes and ketones for the boiling point. So here's a problem. Arrange in order of increasing boiling point those three molecules, and I give the answer right there. Aldehydes can't 
hydrogen bond to other aldehydes because although the aldehydes have a prominent H on them, that H is not bonded to O. So water solubility. The carbonyl group oxygen can H bond with water, so al aldehydes and ketones have similar solubilities with comparable alcohols. By comparable, I mean about the same molar mass. So we see in our table there, I'm showing an alkane, which cannot hydrogen bond with water, so it's not water soluble. And in our next diagram, we're seeing an aldehyde, which can H bond, because the aldehyde has the O, and water has the H bonded to O. And we have next an alcohol, which can hydrogen bond as well. So here's a problem. Arrange in order of increasing water solubility, acetone, pentanyl, and 2-decanone. And I've got the answer there. Our next category is the carboxylic acids. So they, those contain C, double bond O, OH. And the ending is oic acid. We have a little space between the oic and the acid. No number is needed for the C, O, O, H. It's always C1, kind of like in the aldehydes. This C, O, O, H is also called the carboxyl group. Our smallest carboxylic acid is methanoic acid. So it's one carbon big. It is also called, its common name is formic acid. It's what's in stinging ants. The alcohol, the next biggest, the one that's also in alcoholic drinks, that's ethanoic acid, also called acetic acid. That's its common name. It's in vinegar. And I'm showing propanoic acid with a phenyl group at carbon number 2. So that would make it 2-phenyl propanoic acid. So make sure that you can name that. Physical properties. So carboxylic acids can H bond to each other, kind of like the alcohols. They form a special kind of ring structure. And as a result, the boiling points of carboxylic acids are a little bit higher than those of comparable alcohols. So here's a problem, a range in order of increasing boiling points. Water solubility, so carboxylic acids can hydrogen bond to water, so their solubility is high, and their solubilities in water are similar to those of comparable alcohols, ketones, and aldehydes. They're even a little bit higher. Our next category is esters. A big property of esters is they often smell good, so they contain the C double bond O OR group. For nomenclature, first the R group on oxygen is named as an alkyl group, and then the parent name, the whole rest of the molecule, is named and Ah, okay. Okay, so the, I, I have changed the way that I've said this already. So first, the R group on oxygen is named as an alkyl group. And then the parent acid, because esters are made from, carbo from combining a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. That's how we get an ester. So the carboxylic acid, the, the portion of it that looks kind of like the carboxylic acid, that's the original carboxylic acid that the ester was made from. So we have, once again, first the R group on the O is named as an alkyl group, and then the parent acid, the rest of the molecule ending oic acid, is replaced with 8. Okay, so let's make sense of that by looking at these examples. We have here methyl ethanoate. How we name that? So the methyl is that single carbon group that is on the O. That's 
how we start methyl. And then the rest of the molecule, that's what came from ethanoic acid. And that's because it's two carbons big. So the, the one carbon is the carbonyl carbon. The other one is that carbon on the leftmost side. So, and it's a ester, so the ending is O8. So what we have is methyl ethanoate. Our next compound, so if we look to the carbons on the right side, we have five, so we have pentyl. And then we have remaining four carbons, so we have butanoate, pentyl butanoate. Sometimes those the pentyl, butanoate, all those, those two kind of like separate words are merged together into one, but your book keeps them separate. Our next example is a little bit more complex. We will skip that for now. Go below. So go to where we have ethyl butanoate. We have a two carbon group on the O, so that's ethyl. The rest of the compound is the four carbons big, it's an ester, so we have ethyl butanoate. We can draw esters, of course, the other way around. And what we have to do is realize that we are looking at the O and the R group attached to it to name first, whether it's written on the right side or the left side. And then we name the rest of the molecule. We see that in these examples I've given, some of them I've given a scent associated with them. That would be that these esters are really in apricot or pineapple or banana. And they have a scent that is kind of like that. Of course, the real apricot, pineapple, banana have a, a, a whole array of different chemicals in them that give them their, their fruity taste, their fruity smell to us but these are some of the main components. Our last functional group is the amines, and those contain nitrogen, which has usually the three single bonds around it and the lone pair because of that lone pair. Amines are bases. They are one of the main base in the whole organic world. They are, of course, weak bases. So that is it for our chapter 22 lecture. And definitely go back over your handout notes, looking at all the examples, making sure that they make sense to you. Read over the parts of chapter 22 that we have covered. Chapter 22 has a lot more to it that we have not covered. And do the homework problems that I've assigned. And when the quiz for chapter 22 is open, be sure to get in there and take it.